it's pretty good sources. And they, they, the Chinese people at large, are starting to move into silver. In fact, I've gotten one report that they've moved into silver in, um, in a manner that's commensurate with like 50 years ago. In other words, silver really... David Morgan, The Morgan Report, how are you? Doing well, thank you, Andy. Thank you for coming up on board. Um, I had you on, it's been about six months ago. There is a lot of stuff going on, um, especially uh, geopolitically. I'd like to start with that again. Um, just wanted your opinions on this war with Russia and Ukraine seems to be escalating now. Um, and NATO seems to be provoking or just we're being sucked into this as uh, as time goes on. What is your opinion on that? What's going on over there and uh, what it really means for for us? Well, let me start, uh, you know, before it started, really. I mean, there was an agreement that was made that the U.S. really didn't abide by, which was around the Donbass region. And uh, you can look into it. I don't have all the details memorized. <clears throat> but basically... Uh, I think, you know, Putin had had enough and uh, we're breaking our, our agreement. And so this conflict started. And, you know, one of the adages I used, I wrote about it when it first began, you know, one of the first things that you lose in war is the truth. You know, so you're hearing about Ukraine's kicking the Russian butt and vice versa. And really, unless you're there <clears throat> to objectively determine you know, what's happening on a battle by battle basis, but on an overview, it's escalating. That's unfortunate. The escalation has been primarily through NATO. And of course, the other side will respond. And of course, you could argue whether Russia started it or not. Again, I have my own opinion, which is the minority, but I don't want to dwell on that. We have to accept where we're at. The problem is on, um, on the, I'll call it the U.S. and quotation mark side, is that there's mercenaries in there as well, but that's never talked about. I used to actually be a subscriber to Soldier Fortune magazine, believe it or not, because a lot of those guys are very independent free thinkers, and I don't align with a lot of their philosophy, but still it was good. And I try to read both sides always, you know, left, right, and center. I never try to just, you know, go with a libertarian view, which is more or less what I am. Now, it's hard to put me or anyone really in a specific box. So, but, uh, so there's part, you know, so, you know, I think why is, why is it happening? And there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one is one that very few people will talk about outside of alternative media, which of course will get labeled, which is fine, but it's, you know, Ukraine's the biggest money laundering center in the world. So they don't want to lose that. And the second one is, if you look at it on a really big perspective, uh, even going back to George Orwell's 1984, you really need these perpetual wars. I mean, the whole thing that Eisenhower warned us about on this, you know, military industrial complex has several vectors, you know, I mean, a vector could be, you know, what his uh, granddaughter uh, talks about with, uh, you know, aliens, UFOs. I'm not going to go down that road, but. The other big vector is how the, the U.S. economy really works. And the U.S. economy really works best at war, unfortunately, um, you know, from a dollars in and out perspective. And as you may have seen me all oh, talk about, lecture on, whatever, is uh, all wars are bankers' wars. And this, of course, is really a truth. And um, Schmidley Butler, who was a general I think World War II wrote, you know, war is a racket after he had really done a lot for the United States, but again, in quotation marks, because he realized it was for U.S. corporate interests to keep their uh, dominance in certain areas outside of the U.S. borders to maintain a high profit margins in countries that they were taking advantage of. And that really hasn't stopped. It's just become more sophisticated, more subtle more, let's say, opaque because of the way it's done and the propaganda machine being so efficient that many Americans, unless they're willing to really dive in deeply, 
and think on their own, don't realize these things and take the propaganda at face values. Well, I said enough, Andy, you can reel me in. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. Um, if you would, I guess I am very, very similar to you politically in the sense of I'm a political party. I'm a constitutionalist, if you would. Um, and you can even, I can even live with the label of a libertarian, but that's another story. But I guess what I'm, I'm wondering, do things change if Trump gets elected or is this just military industrial complex? It doesn't really machine doesn't really matter what party is in or what president can what presidential candidates in, do you think? Well, looking back in the history, which is really the best way to look forward is in, in almost all cases, it doesn't. I mean, it's really there almost as a publicity stunt at this point. Right. Nonetheless, you do have to look, you know, a little more closely. I mean, if you look at what happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis under the Kennedy administration, I think if you had a less balanced leader in there at the time, the outcome might have been different. That's conjecture. I forget. <laughs> but, and so will Trump, you know, I mean, I, I watched the debate. I seldom waste my time, honestly. I mean, I, I just despise politics because it's so corrupt everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, but nonetheless, I decided I would watch it. I had so many friends ask me if I would watch the debate, you know, with, with Harris Trump. Debate. I did, but to get back to your question, he claims that he could stop the war even before a president wants on, you know, president elect. That's a bold claim. Maybe he can, and I would like to see that. And so could it, could it be a difference? Yes, it could. Do I think it will be? No, I don't. Uh, but those are just opinions. You're asking for my opinion. I, I really don't know. I'd love to think, I mean, you know, as a libertarian slash constitutionalist, I mean, you know, the Monroe doctrine, I mean, basically mind your own damn business, I mean, defend their own borders. We, you know, preserve our interests, but our interest is as cloaked in to spread democracy. That's the, that's the cover. That's the propaganda. The real interest is to exploit the resources in other nations for maximum benefit to the U S and the U S dollar. I mean, that's the truth. And then you go overseas and see, um, you know, other countries and, you know, people said they hate us or whatever. And really I'm pretty world traveled and the people for the most part, seem to really like America, not everywhere. Uh, France might be an area they probably, you know, most of my encounters, they didn't, but nonetheless, the point is. It's these, it's the leaders, it's these megalomaniacs, these psychopaths that are at the top of the chain that are a lot of times installed by the political forces of the Anglo-American empire. And so really it's a mess in a way, because, you know, if there really was democracy, I mean, if there's such a thing as real democracy, I'm not sure that there is, but if there was, and the people voted worldwide what they wanted, you think the world would look like this? I mean, we all want peace. We all want freedom. We all want to just live our lives and be left alone and, you know, get along with each other. Sure, there'll be skirmishes and you'll fight your family and your daughter will upset you and all that human stuff. But we wouldn't be sitting there making up all these massive means of destruction so we can annihilate each other. Yeah. Um, so, again, I digress, but it really appalls me. I was on an interview. Well, I'll go on a little bit in London some time ago. And I forget the exact question, but I said, you know, if you go back to the basic tenet of all major religion, religions, it's thou shalt not kill yet. You always seem to justify it. So. Yeah. So how does this, or where do you see this ending? If you would, do you see this going into a, the conflict increasing or do you see, I mean, I guess you create now it's just pretty much annihilated um as far as just economically but yeah well where, where do you see this ending or do you see nato again dropping dropping bombs in, in moscow or well one i don't know but again you're asking my opinion one thing i know from study of markets and really geopolitics isn't my strong suit but i have to look at it you know all, all the time because it affects the market so much but uh in the markets, there's an adage that a trend in motion continues until it actually stops. 
So the trend is more and more and more war, not less and less and less. So that trend is in motion. It will probably, and the trend within the trend is it's increasing, not decreasing. Hmm. And so that is something that I will just say that it looks like it's going to increase, whether that means, you know, further escalation in the, in the Russia as far as the capital or not. I don't know. It could. I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Uh, again, coming back to the, you know, the Mr. T card, um, you know, whether that's just a uh, political rhetoric to get elected or, or something you could really accomplish, if that were to occur, then I think the, the trend will certainly have not stopped, but it will have lost momentum and then you'd have to reevaluate, but you have to go with what is. And what yeah. is, is unfortunately an escalation. You see what's going on, you know, in the Middle East and, uh, you know, these proxy countries that are on the sidelines, sort of waiting, I would say. And then we don't know uh, what kind of social unrest we're going to see in this country between now and election. And unfortunately, there's a trend building there that's uh, subtle but observable. And that would, of course, only increase the overall trend of, let's just call it more unrest. I mean, war is an ugly word. It's a truthful word. That's what it is. But, you know, I mean, there's really a war of ideology in the United States. And that is going, is in the streets, uh, not reported very often. And it's rather small relative to something in the Middle East. Nonetheless, it's taking place. And I believe we'll probably ask yeah, that's a very thought out and good answer and an answer they don't like, but I agree with, if that all makes sense. Does. I want your opinion really on what's going on in China. It seems like a lot of deflationary forces have hit and are hitting, but also um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of tension there. Surprise with us in Taiwan. <laughs> so what's your, uh, you know, asking you just a personal opinion, what's going on over there and is that going to keep on escalating or are we going to see a de-escalation in that? All right. I got to break it down into two parts. We're going to talk about China, the mainland, and then I'll get to Taiwan. In China, the mainland, there's been, uh, obviously lots of disruption in two main areas, the two areas, really the Chinese people trusted the most. And that is if I'm going to invest, I'm going to invest in real estate and that's pretty much blown. And then, of course, the banking system is what it is, and there have many, many bank failures. So the Chinese have experienced today what was experienced by Americans in the 1930s. I mean, there were people, many, and I don't know what, I won't say many, I don't know what the numbers are, I have to research. But there were an amount of people that could have paid off their mortgages and kept their farms with the money or savings they had in the bank. But, you know, being a student of the capital and making their payments on the farm and having a good crop or whatever, you keep a reserve and you keep that reserve in ready cash. But then your bank fails and now you have none of the capital that you, you know, put in trust with them. And now your farm is taken because you couldn't pay the mortgage. I mean, that's a horrifying idea to think, of, you know, but the bank sure. fails. So the point I'm making is this is happening in China. Not They're not paying off their farms. And I'm just saying that. You know, they have savings in a bank, close, and you don't get anything. You don't have like FDIC insurance. So, so that's really moved the Chinese base into gold, and that's been going on for a while. But silver is the big question. It's always gold and silver for me. And I've gotten some, you know, I've had contacts in China. Uh, the real people that live there are living in Taiwan. So I don't have anybody I could call that's in downtown Beijing. But nonetheless, I put pretty good sources. And they, they, the Chinese people at large, are starting to move into silver. In fact, I've gotten one report that they've moved into silver in, um, in a manner that's commensurate with like 50 years ago. In other words, silver really wasn't ever considered an investment for the Chinese people or the Chinese public for the last several decades, although they did buy gold for it. Now it's spilled over to silver. I also wrote someone that wrote me on LinkedIn. I'll keep his anonymity. And he said he had good contacts there. So it's hearsay, but you, know, you can usually smell out if somebody's legit or not. And I think he is. 
And I asked him to verify what I just said. He said, absolutely. Uh, Chinese public is coming in as silver in a big way. So now I'll move to Taiwan. Taiwan is critical for the, you know, semiconductor industry, the chips, and we all know it and China knows it. So at this point, you know, a trend in motion continues. I mean, the trend is talk, 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 but nothing happens. And I think that's going to continue. I really have a hard time making a case that the Chinese mainland will actually physically go into Taiwan and, and take it over or, or reintegrate it into the mainland or whatever the talk is. Um, I may be wrong. I hope I'm correct. They may mitigate. I mean, they try to do, you know, uh, administration type things with tax or, you know, whatever, but, uh, I'm not really that concerned about it. I mean, it's the boy who cried wolf. We've heard it over and over and over again. And then yet, you know, that wolf doesn't show up. Could it? You bet. Does it worry me? Yes. But I am not as concerned about that being a reality as I am an escalation, the overall geopolitical climate where the wars in different areas continue to increase in size. And so yeah. Well, that's some good news, I guess. um you said something very interesting here um and that could really i mean i don't want to be sound hyperbolic here but that could that i think it's very significant with the chinese accumulation accumulation of physical silver because that's really what has propelled and held up the price of gold for the last i would say this recent run we've had over two thousand dollars um Currently, we're at over $2,500. So if and when that does happen, and certainly sounds like it is happening, we could see a significant surge again in the price of silver, correct? That's correct. And if you couple it with what's going on in the industrial side where that sector continues to grow, uh, you could get in a place where you have a dual demand. I mean, industry has to buy. You know, investors don't. But if it gets uh, such a tight market and industry sees that uh, they're out of business unless they stockpile silver, because usually they just buy it on a just-in-time inventory basis, then there could be, uh, let's say, a larger-than-normal delivery to Samsung, Mitsubishi, or Apple (laughs) computer, whoever. And all of a sudden, um, now you've got a competition for the remaining stock whatever. So it could be, you know, a synergistic effect where both investment and industrial demand come at the same. And then you get kind of a leapfrogging thing where, well, I've got all the silver I need for the next six months for my business, but that's set a new, let's say, floor in the silver price to make up a number $40 an ounce. And so that $40, but sub $40 an ounce silver has probably gone away for a long time believe it or not. And that becomes a new floor. And then investors push it up to 50 or whatever. So I'm still very bullish on the market. I haven't been for, you know, for a while. I mean, I've been overall bullish. I still believe you should have it through thick and thin and all that. I don't want to uh, discredit myself, but as far as, you know, what it looks like in the silver market on a you know, intermediate term basis. So I haven't been this bullish in quite some. And that is because of what you, again, your really good sources that you're hearing of Chinese buying. That well, combined with everything else, yes. Yeah, combined with everything else. One of the things that I've always wondered, the question is, why doesn't the Samsung or an Apple or a Tesla just buy a couple silver mines? And so then they, they have do. All- Samsung in particular buys direct from Avino. Very really? few people know that. Yeah, you, but thanks for bringing that up. And, uh, you know, absolutely. I mean, they, they are looking ahead. And so they're going to the source. They basically have a sweet deal with the Vino mines and they take their, their silver directly. And that's smart. Uh, yeah. Because you don't want to be out of business because you can't source your main, well, one of your most key ingredients, let's say. I mean, you know, you can have all the ingredients for a cake, but if you don't get the sugar and the sugar is priced out of your, you know, maybe you have the money to buy it. It just doesn't exist. I mean, well, yeah. 
you know, your bakery business is down the tubes. You're out of business. Make something that looks like a cake. <laughs> <tastes like, laughs> I got a problem. Yeah. Well, we, uh, you know, the morning report, we, you know, really look at the equity side the most. And uh, we specialize in a certain sector of the equities, and that revolves around the streaming and royalty because they have a huge advantage over the general mining industry. But we've looked at everything. It's not just silver. We've done gold, silver, copper, lithium. We've done rare earth elements before almost anyone caught on to the term, uh, cobalt, the battery metals, you know, that type of thing. So right now, uh, the value in, in the miners is extremely beneficial. And the market hasn't caught on to that fact. So I'm going to be making a new offer on the website here probably within a month. I just finished the videos for it last night. It is sales. I mean, you know, I try to make, I make a living at, at what I do. Go ahead. But I'm just going to give out the portfolio for a uh, much less cost than subscribing to the whole service because the millennials are like, ah, oh, you know, I hear you, you know, on Andy's show, I don't need to read your geopolitics. Just tell me what stocks to buy. So yeah. that's what I've done. So we're preparing that now. And it goes from the top tier to the mid tier, the junior producers and the rank speculations. And the main thing that I've done, which has been much more successful than most in our business, is to weight the portfolio. Yeah. Big money goes into big companies. We started when I did. You know, some of these companies are up tenfold. So, you know, gold started at 250 and it's at 2,500. So it's up tenfold. And some of our stocks are. But yeah. a lot of these juniors have gone bye bye. They no longer exist, they've gone to zero. So you've got to really know what you're doing to put together a portfolio that works to your benefit and mitigates risk and, and uh, magnifies reward. And that's what we've done over the years. We've been perfect. No, we've had bad years. Yes. But you know, timing's everything. And now's the time. If I can, um, without asking specific names, if I could brought a little bit more into that, um, if you're building a silver portfolio, would it be advantageous just to stick with, stick with the bigger names and the bigger producers? Yeah, I used to have a lot of hedge funds, you know, smaller hedge funds. I'm not talking about the big names everyone knows, but guys from Europe that run, most of Europe is done differently than the U.S. I mean, the U.S., most investors have a, you know, an online account of some type and trade their own stocks or read a newsletter and buy what, and sell what they say or whatever. In Europe, almost everybody has managed money and they have these small, Managed accounts, and these guys are in and out, you know, of the mining sector. We're early on quite a bit. Point being is, I used to just look at the top tier only, and that's the only ones I'd report monthly that were, you know, one, two, three, four, five kind of thing. We only have six in the top tier. You don't mm -hmm. need to have a hundred stocks to make money. In fact, the more you dilute yourself, kind of the worse you are. So if you, you got to have a rifle. Up there. So anyway, I would just that so. When we held a hot hand, or let's say I, the market was more favorable from 2000, 2011, we had 11 years of gold went up year over year for 11 straight years. I mean, okay. it's hard to look dumb when the market's that strong. Right. But anyway, you know, we would put out which of the top tier were doing the best. And these guys would switch between them sure. and just kind of ride that wave. And so, yeah, there's something to it. I'll just say this. There's six stocks in the top tier right now two of them are making all-time highs as we speak there aren't too many in this industry that can say that especially out of a field of six that 33 percent are making all-time um so you know i'm not trying to pat myself on the back uh you know i've certainly taken my hits and deservedly so in some instances but nonetheless if you know the big picture, the long term, and how the system works, or how to invest properly with weighting your portfolio, where big money goes into big, these are big companies, and this is where you know these are making new highs. And someone's you know got a penny stock out there, it's you know bought it at twelve cents, and maybe it's selling at sixteen right now at an all time high, right? But as soon as there's any real selling in it, it's dropped back to twelve, and some of those stocks will take off. I'm not trying to degrade the junior mining now that we wouldn't have a mining industry because the majors don't want to spend the money on it. Right. Let all these speculators go out and waste their money 
until they make a discovery, then they'll pay a small premium for it and uh, still make it. So, yeah. you know, they, and that's business. I mean, that's capitalism. That's the way the system works. But uh, so I'm happy to see that. Uh, and I also think it's a precursor to what's coming because on a value basis, some of these stocks are doing better than a lot of the S&P 500 on a value basis. So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't mind, let me ask you, what is your, like, especially with the mid-tier to the juniors, what's your process in evaluating them? Do you look at jurisdictions more than management or vice versa, or do you look at grade or what, what's important to you? It's really tough. I mean, the number one really is people. You know, if they've been there and done that, they've been successful in the past, and usually uh that's the start financing is always important you know they got to have the money on a mid-tier you know they've already established that they are a mine so they're mining so now what you have to determine is how well is it managed and what's their cash flow look like do they have free cash flow where they can expand do they have projects that they've drilled out partially that may add to their resource base and those type of things. We do look at geopolitics, of course, but that isn't the number one. We first look at it of, you know, what is the most dollar value per share uh, on a profitable basis? And then we d drill down from there. On the junior producers, uh, similar process. Those we look for how much growth they have mostly. And again, if they have a margin or not, I mean, if you're a junior producer, it's like star, a star, it's a startup. So you have to look at, you know, if they're not making money, but they're close, you know, yeah. if they're mining their silver at, you know, 29 and the market's at 27. Well, it usually makes sense to keep going for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to look at what their cash flow is in all these companies, but particularly in the smaller ones. And then in the rank speculations, it's just, you know, I have had a cold hand of late. In fact, I just did a video last night on, I think, the eight that we're holding or I'm holding still. And I went through every one and, you know, put up their website, named the stock, said where it was in the list, why I bought it. And I actually left feeling pretty good <laughs> because in almost all these cases, the ones I've picked, I've got such phenomenal stories that can be proven. They're not because most of these are story stocks and it's a story story. Right. And most of mine are stories that I can prove that this drill result has been like an ounce per ton. You don't get drill results of an ounce per ton very often or close to it. The okay. problem with that particular company is it's not in a real favorable jurisdiction. But if you get an ounce per ton gold, Somebody's going to mine. It, yeah. Right? So, you know, I went through it again. And I just kept repeating, you know, these are rank speculations. Bet a little to win a lot. But what I do differently than a lot of guys, gals, is if that stock makes an appreciable move, usually there's a material change, which has to be reported to the SEC. Now you actually get to go to the horse track Make your bet, watch the race till it's three quarters of the way done, and make another bet. So if that horse is in the lead and you see that and you say, wait a minute, this stock just went from 12 cents to 80 cents. Mm -hmm. And everybody's selling because they made so much money. But it's actually worth five bucks because now you know the material change in the company. We made a discovery. Discovery's this big. The grade is this amount. And how much is that worth per share? And if that comes out five bucks and everyone's selling 80 cents, buy it at 80 cents. Right. Write it up to three or four bucks. And I have a couple of friends that have done that and retired because yeah. I don't have the guts to move big money. <laughs> Even if I know that I'm still too much of a little, little chicken, I'll move on. <laughs> you know, not a schoolboy investment. I'll move on a series, more serious. Yeah. But, um, but that, that's uh, something that I do for the readers. doesn't happen very often. I got about a one in 4,000 chance. All those mines out there scouting for, you know, the precious metals, lithium, the rare earths, you know, whatever, cobalt, whatever the 
mineral de jure is, usually don't find not not in the right proportions to make an equity. Yeah, talk to me about um, royalty companies. It's I've been fascinated by those for the past couple of years. I'm an investor in a few, and um, it's hard for me to find the holes in the models. <laughs> Where do you go? Well, wrong? there really isn't one. I mean, you know, if you, we we have written on this topic again and again, and I'll write on it. But uh, you've mitigated so many problems. So one of the problems with a high inflationary environment is gold's going to go up and up, and the miners are going to go higher and higher, and the profits are going to go up and up. Well, they might go up. They may not. In other words, even though gold has made a nice big move, if there's a labor strike because people aren't being paid enough and they don't come to the mine to work unless you increase their wages by 50%, you've got a problem. Right. Uh, if the energy costs and oil prices as low as they are now double over the next two years, now you may not have as much profit. Most of those situations for a streamer or a royalty company go away. They're already built into the contract that they're going to get right. so much per ounce. So if I've got a 3% royalty on my gold mine, then I get 3% no matter how much it costs you. So if your profit margin is say five hundred dollars the ounce right now, which in some of these companies it is, pretty good margin. It's you know two thousand a miner or nineteen hundred, and it's twenty five hundred, you're making six hundred dollars the ounce. But then oil doubles and labor goes on strike, and now it's costing you twenty four hundred, uh, and you're getting a hundred dollars margin. Well, that changes the dynamics of owning that mine deal. But the royalty company still gets the three percent. And that's yeah. a gold at an ultimate high. Right. Yeah, I've uh, talked to a few at some of the different conferences, and I'm sure we talked to some of the same ones. And uh, it's just really hard for me to see the hole in that. Maybe too small of a portfolio, a royalty portfolio. I'm just trying to think of it. Just well, I started to... a royalty. Because, and we had one uh, silver royalty, which did better than we expected. We had to wait a couple of years. I was bought out or I wasn't me. I mean, those shareholders, I was just happened to be the CEO, but, um, but there, everyone was starting these mini micro cap royalty companies. I just happened to be one of the first of a bunch. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys were buying stuff that just wasn't economic, didn't make any sense. Right. And so ours did, and then we had a bunch of cash and then we emerged. But the point is that, uh, still a good model and you're right. You can't really have too small a portfolio, but if you go one of the big royalty, well, for example, one of our picks was, you know, Silver Wheaton back when, you know, not too many people knew of it. So that company, if you bought silver at an all time high, nominal high back in uh, May 1st, 2011, you know, almost $50 an ounce, that stock was like a 34. Now it's at like 50. So if you bought silver instead of the miner or the royal, the streamer, you would have, you'd be down about half your investment, you know, 48 mm. premium to call it 50 some silvers at what, almost 30 to 29. Whereas if you'd bought Wheaton, <clears throat> you would be up about 20 bucks, 20 on 30, you'd be up what, 60, 70%. And uh, you balance it. I've always taught, you know, have the real metal first, but, and, you know, my, my angst, I guess, with the industry is that most of my friends that are in the bullion only business will tell you never buy a mining stock because bullion does at least as well, if not better. That's true on the average, but not if you know what the hell you're doing. Right. If you know what you're doing, you'd do better. In fact, one of our other ones, had you bought that stock instead of gold at the 2000 high. Now I know it's 2,500 pushing new highs as we speak, but that stock is double. So that would mean, you know, $4,000, which we don't. Have. So there is a reason to buy these stocks, but you just don't, you know, arbitrarily get, you know, all these fancy names, with these wonderful stories. Do that. You know, usually go broke. Once in a while, you'll hit. And that's what makes it such a, great industry is to you know write this great ad copy and get everyone excited and you know everyone wants to bet 12 cents you know yeah 
have a $25 stock, but believe me, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, one last question about the equities. Um, assuming, and this is an assumption, because I, I don't know what's going to happen, but assuming, let's say you get a sell-off, a general sell-off, a, a hard sell-off in the general market. Do you see the, the mining stocks getting cheaper? Because gold and silver had been pretty firm throughout all of this. So that would be, yeah, that's really my first question. And then my second question would be, do you even see a sell-off in the general equities? Because we're living in this inflationary environment. It just hasn't happened, if that makes sense. No, they both make sense. Generally, yeah, when we get a big sell-off in the market, a big one, the miners will go down with. They are stocks. And, right. uh, and in 2008, when that happened, they were the first to recover. So the metal went down and the mining shares went down and they all recovered quickly and mm -hmm. started to really make moves. I mean, silver went from around the $9 handle up to $50. I remember so that. you went for almost a 500% gain or better. And then gold, I forget what it bottomed at, but it I think doubled or more than I'd have to look. So I think that would be similar, that it would go down. As far as the stock market going to go down, I changed my opinion. I think it's possible with the inflationary environment and, you know, adding to the national debt at, you know, every trillion, every quarter, you know, what's a trillion among friends? <laughs> <laughs> you should give it to me, I guess. <laughs> That's so, so big, I can't even understand it. <laughs> so, no one can. So, it um, may just continue to do what all the hyperinflations have done in the past. And the stock market does just keep going. Yeah. It's just what's the value. And the value uh, depreciates. Even though you get more and more bigger numbers and bigger numbers and bigger numbers, the value that currencies depreciate is seen depreciating faster than your stock gain. Better sure. to be in the stock market than the bank where you're going to lose it instantly. Yeah. And the stock market is going to mitigate some of that, but not totally. In the Weimar Republic and the Zimbabwe, hyperinflation, Argentina, all these countries that have experienced it, uh, gold and silver have really been the one place to maintain the purchasing power of not receiving. Sure. And so that's why, you know, crypto, could it do it? Well, certainly it depends where you start. You know, I have a hard time with uh, Bitcoin at these levels. Um, because the the price is around sixty thousand per Bitcoin, yeah, and the mining of it is higher than that in most cases. So it'd be like a gold miner going out and mining gold at uh, losing money. <laughs> thousand the ounce cost and selling it for twenty five hundred just right. Know, Speaking of crypto, and this is just me, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. I just, I guess I just stay in my lane. I mean, results speak for themselves, but I just stay in my lane yeah, with what I know. Well, I think that's a good input for me and for the community. I mean, anyone that watches your channel or whatever, because we may have hit that exhaustion point temporarily. In other words, as the early adapters, there are the people, and then there's a small momentum of people that jump on the backs of the early adopters. I mean, Bitcoin has been around since what, 2009? Right. So we've been around for a while. We may have hit that plateau where really everyone that wants in is in. Mm -hmm. And that means, you know, the only thing that's going to force it higher is new buyers or new buying. You could have people that already own it that want to buy more. But, you know, if you bought it at 55, 60, you probably don't want to buy any more. And if you bought it at 20, you're thinking it's got to go to 120,000. Anyway, the point being is that there doesn't appear to be much new buy. It seems to have stagnated. If that's the case, the market will either go sideways or down. It won't go up. Right. We may see, um, and then when this mining thing gets out, the investors that have bought all these miners are looking at the compensation that the uh, management is receiving versus the terrible beating that the shareholders are taking. Uh, that won't last too long. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, lastly, if I uh, just want to ask about this, um, 
pivot very briefly. Just what are your thoughts on oil? Um, for the life of me, well, I, I do have an idea and I think I know what you're going to say. But with everything that's going on in the world and all the drawdowns that we have on crude, or I should say West, West Texas, um, why is oil, I mean, it seems like it's just broken down from here. Which yeah, is- it has. And I'm looking, uh, I'm going to start doing some more serious work, maybe burn the midnight oil, which I haven't done in a while, excuse me. Uh, but uh, <laughs> there might be an oil company or two that are worth investing in here. And uh, I think long term, that'd be really, really smart. Um, oil's not going away. It really is the most efficient use for energy we know of right now, or at least we have available. Uh, my documentary, silversunrise.tv, explores a lot of these alternatives. Some of them can be proven, but they've been squashed, quelled, suppressed, whatever you want to call it. And I'm all for that. I mean, the world runs on energy, not on money. And the yeah. more energy and the less costly it is to everybody, the better everyone's lifestyle is. So, but in the meantime, it runs on oil. So okay. as a practical man, uh, yeah, I'm looking at that and maybe, uh, you know, buying something very unloved, very almost hated. I mean, so many people, you know, want to drive an electric car and all that. I'm free market. Drive a doggone electric car, but at least understand it's probably the least green thing you can do. <laughs> Don't tell me you're being green. Drive an electric car. You haven't done your homework. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, David, I think we'll end with that. How can people find you and uh, get access to uh, the Morgan Report? Just go to themorganreport.com and uh, take a look around. Get on the blog. It's free. Uh, look at the, uh, you'll get a pop up now to get on the free report if you're interested in the paid work. There's a subscribe button that you pull down and get the sales pitch. Uh, and then take a look at my documentary. It's almost done as far as the amount of filming we're going to do. And then it's going to be probably four or five month editing process. Hope to have it out by Christmas. Uh, it's silversunrise.tv. There's a lot of trailers there. Uh, we've got G. Edward Griffin. We've got uh, yours truly, Foster Gamble from the Thrive movies. Um, uh, Ellen Brown from Web of Debt. Uh, she's one of the best, uh, constitutional attorneys in the country, Dr. Edwin Vieira. Uh, we'll have some clips from Dr. Ron Paul and it's more than just a problem. I mean, the producer is a gentleman that did Fiat Empire, one of his first films, and he kind of wanted my film to be Fiat Empire too. I told him, no, I want to look at the spiritual side of money, why it's causing us stress and how much control it really has over all of us. And how we can break free of that as a humanity, not as the U.S., not as North America, everywhere and everyone. And of course, that goes back to what I said earlier: the energy situation. So, so it's a, it'll be kind of a repeat of what we know about the money system. You have to kind of put that in there as a foundational argument. This is how they run us. But then, what's beyond that? What could we do individually or collectively to make this world a better place? And, well, just to kick some banker's ass, but I may have gone too far. <laughs> no, you haven't. Uh, David, I want to thank you so much for your time. I'll put all of this in the show notes below the video. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.